Amen. I'd like to have everybody here turn to the book of Ephesians. Would you do that? Oh, I'm always glad to be back here to church, but especially tonight. Uh, you know, tomorrow the Michigan Revival Conference is going to be beginning, and I'll say something about that in just a moment. But how appropriate can you get for our church? This is Missions Month. <clears throat> can I tell you, there's a direct connection between revival and missions. Always has been. Uh, the plan of Jesus Christ was that his people would be filled with the Holy Spirit, that's uh, revival, and that they would be witnesses both in their own city and to the uttermost part of the earth. And matter of fact, every missionary movement in the history of the world began in a revival, so that's appropriate. The other deal is, <clears throat> I'm always fortunate if I happen to be back, and I'm hardly ever back, when the young people are back from camp, having been touched by revival. And uh, these were good testimonies. Thank you, and thank you for letting the Lord have his way in your life. This has really been wonderful. Now Ephesians 3. Turn to Ephesians 3. Brother Flanders is preaching tonight. I always like to be able to speak in my home church, but I also am aware of everything else going on and missionaries who come after me. So uh, I, I am aware of the time. I know most of you think that I'm never aware of the time, but I'm going to be aware of the time. Uh, my wife's back there to wave her hand, so if you see a little hand back there, you'll know what's going on, but I know what's happening. I know, and I'm glad for my, I told our brother Howell up there, your testimonies fit right in with the verses I'm going to read and what I'm about to say. So it's like one sermon. So we'll subtract your time from my sermon, so that's how long it will be. I'll feel fine about that. Now you ought to come to the Michigan Revival Conference. Actually, in the month of June, 2016, that's uh, uh, three years ago. Uh, the Michigan Revival Conference was born in the mind of a group of preachers down in uh, St. Clair County. As a matter of fact, I preached there this morning. Before I'm done, I'll mention this. Did you know that the gospel, the first time the gospel was ever clearly preached in the state of Michigan was in St. Clair County? And I know the story, I'll mention something about that, but I was there this morning in the same place where that prayer meeting took place in June of 2016. And you'd have to be there to know I'm not exaggerating. Jesus Christ talked to a group of preachers about having a public conference on revival, what he wants to do with his churches, which took place in 2017, then again 2018, and now it starts tomorrow. So, now, in the past, we've had meetings at First Baptist Church, the best church in Michigan. And a nice big auditorium, but because of scheduling, it's going to be other places. So you'll have to uh, do a little work, make a little effort and sacrifice to get there. So I'd like to ask you to do a few things. Show up tomorrow night. Tomorrow night is at Emmanuel Baptist Church of Corona. Unfortunately, churches with Christian schools know each other across the state through athletic rivalry. <laughs> but we're going to uh, put down all of our uh, bad feelings and uh, forgive them, okay? And we're gonna show up tomorrow, okay? Seven o'clock tomorrow night. I'm gonna be speaking, and uh, Pastor Wayne Van Gelbren, one of the speakers you maybe have not heard. You know the Van Gelbren name. He's gonna be there, and we're gonna have a tremendous meeting tomorrow night at Emmanuel Baptist Church of Corona which I think is about 40 minutes from here. Not really that far, really, uh, it's close. Then the morning, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., and afternoon, 1.30, 15, with lunch in between. Meetings are gonna happen at Landmark Baptist Church in Clio, which is real close. And many of you would be very much helped by the daytime meetings, and I'd like to tell you what each one is about because I know what the subjects are. This year is gonna be really different and they're gonna really help us solve problems and get on the revival road. They really will by knocking down barriers that keep us from the fullness of God's blessing. Ephesians 3, did I tell you that before? Turn to Ephesians 3. So you'll wanna to come to all of those and that is tomorrow night, not in the daytime, tomorrow night at Corona and then Tuesday night, Wednesday, Thursday night at Corona and then the daytime at Clio starting Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the Michigan Revival Conference. Now, in the bulletin this morning, I understand there was this card that shows a guy on here kneeling down on one of the beaches of one of the Great Lakes in Michigan, 
begging God for revival. I should mention that on Tuesday night, part of the meeting is we're going to have a big statewide public prayer time crying out to God for the churches to be revived in our state and for our state to be delivered from evil. Because I'm going to tell you right now, if, you, if you've not paid attention, the state of Michigan is in the grips of evil and it's not getting better. But you know what? Light is more power than powerful than darkness. And if the people of God get revived, we'll see that turned around. And I think it can happen in answer to prayer, like Tuesday night, going to be there. Now, this tells you about all the speakers, all that kind of thing. It was in the bulletin. Maybe you didn't know that, but I got a bunch more. And if you are thinking that you're going to make a sacrifice and make plans to come to some of the sessions, I want you to have one of these cards. How many of you would say, I may have had the card in my hand sometime today, but I don't have it now and I'd like to have one to get myself over here or over there for some of the other meetings. Would you raise your hand? Okay, just a few of you. So I'm putting them right down here. You see where I'm putting them? Follow me. All the eyes following me. See, watch this. Right down there. And there's some in the lobby. Come up and pick them up. Another thing you can do with the card is pray for the conference, please. Then I wish you would also pray about having a part financially in the conference just by asking God what he would have you to do. And uh, let's see God do something phenomenal and history making this week. And people who know God can have that happen. Matter of fact, we're going to look at that right now. Ephesians 3, go down to verse 14. Here's a prayer. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family, God's family, in heaven and in earth is named. You know, God's family lives in heaven and also on earth. That is the children of God. So Paul says, I'm bowing my knees before the Father of all of God's children. And I'm praying this, look at verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now the whole book of Ephesians is about what we have in Christ. And there are two major prayers, one in chapter one, where Paul says, I want to ask you, Lord, to let your people know what they've really got in Jesus Christ. And that one, chapter one, is basically, if you read it, about the power we have from the throne. Jesus Christ won the victory over the devil. And from the throne, we have power over the devil. Did you know that? There we are. Now in chapter 3, he's praying that God will help us to see the power that we have within, right within us. And you know what revival is? One way to define revival is when Christians discover Christianity. When Christians discover Christianity, find out what we have. And that's what we want to happen for us for our church, and for God's people, especially all over this state. Not that Michigan means any more to God than anybody else, any place else. But you know what? Michigan is where we live. Dear Lord, will you please grant this to us, that we might have our eyes open to what we have. And let what I say tonight open our eyes a little bit to that, along with what was said by the young people who were touched by you, especially Thursday. Let tonight be a continuation of camp, we ask in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Now, some of you are historical minded people. I am a little bit. The Reformation, they call it in European history in the 1500s. You know what they did in the Reformation? Discovered Christianity. The Christians discovered Christianity. You know that they discovered, in a way, justification by faith. Okay? Now, do you think anybody in the world had been justified by faith before the 1500s and before Luther? Oh, yes. But it wasn't clear in their mind. The church had mixed them all up. And now it was rediscovered. Now, after the Reformation, starting in the 1700s, we started having the revivals. The evangelical revival that transformed England. The Great Awakening that laid the foundation for our country. The Second Great Awakening. The Prayer Revival of 1857, 1858. So many great revivals that have come to the world. And the Reformation was discovering justification by faith. And the revivals was discovering the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul's prayer was about. He says, Lord, I'm praying to you as the father of all your children. And I'm praying that your children all over the world would discover what they have in you. And he specifically says this, I want to pray that they will know. One, two, three, four. Number one, the strength of the Spirit. Did you see that? Verse 16, that he, God, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit. Now, did you know how we were supposed to do things in the Christian life? With the help of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. How many came tonight who would say, I think I'm right and sincere to say that I love Jesus Christ? Raise your hand. Okay, we love him because he first loved us. He said the night before he died, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, now the commandments of Jesus Christ are a tall order. So in the next verse, he says this. And I will pray the Father, he will give you another, another one instead of me. I'm going away. Another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Did you know why you have the Holy Spirit? You have him inside you to help you obey the commandments of Christ. To give you the strength to live the Christian life. Did you know, it's not just what we do, it's how we do it. And I'm going to tell you, Paul is praying May your people know the strength of the Spirit. May they know the power they've got inside to live the Christian life. Acts 1.8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. Now, at our church, there's a strong emphasis, that's one reason I'm a member here, on evangelism and soul winning. But have you ever gone soul winning on your own? Going down the streets, you know the questions to ask. You know the Romans road. You know how to put your foot in the door. You know how to get them to pray with you. But doing it by yourself without the help of the Holy Spirit is a pretty awful way to go soul winning or to build a bus route or to serve at First Baptist Church it is so hard and deadening and frustrating. It's awful. Did you know when you're doing the right thing and it's awful, it's probably because you're not doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit? That's not how you're supposed to do it. We need to be conscious that we need to have the help of the Holy Spirit and have him offering his help for soul winning, for service, for decision making, for marriage, for prayer, and just to live the Christian life. Somebody says, you know what, I'm told I'm supposed to quit this or start doing that, and I just can't. I know you can't. That's why you've got the Holy Ghost. That's why it says I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. God puts us in over our head. Ah! Says, do this, I can. He says, I know you can't. That's why I've commanded you to do it. 
but we got to have the strength of the Spirit. Number two, the life of Christ. This is Christianity, the real thing. The life of Christ, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Now the question comes up after you get saved, how am I going to live the Christian life? Now there is good advice about Bible reading and prayer and coming to church. I know that. But basically, how do you live the Christian life? Two ways. One is bondage. I think some people come to our church and get saved and they say, now I know the Catholic rules, but I don't know the Baptist rules. And they tell me that the first Baptist rules aren't even the same as all the other Baptist rules. So, help me know what the rules are. You know what I'll do? I'll grit my teeth, I'll put my nose to the grindstone, I'll buckle down and try, and I'll live that way if it kills me. I'll love my wife and give myself for her. I'll be kind to others, by trying hard and disciplining myself. I'm gonna friend that I'm gonna tell you something, friend. That's not real Christianity. That's not being a Christian. That's pretending to be a Christian. But here's the wonderful thing. Did you know that when you got saved and the Holy Spirit came inside you, Jesus came inside you. And the Christian life is letting him, him live his life through you. That sounds like preacher talk, but it's for real. The book of Galatians says there's two ways to try to live the life. Number one is law, works, and that's flesh. Law, works, flesh equals bondage. That's why you see some people come to church and they look like this. They look like slaves. Here we are. Okay, there's another way to live it. Here's what it is. Grace, faith, that releases the Spirit. And Galatians calls that liberty. You know what? Two people in this church may live approximately the same life. There are things they don't do, things they do do, and one of them looks like a slave and the other man looks free. That's the difference. It's Christ in us. I am crucified with Christ, Galatians 2. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I'm not living by hard work. I'm living by faith in Jesus Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know what I do it that way? When I say, dear Lord, just like about salvation, I'm incapable of living the Christian life. When I got saved, I said, Lord, I can't, but you can so I'm going to put my faith in you to do for me what you came to earth to do for everyone. What I can't do for myself, can't forgive my own sins, can't give myself a new heart, can't write my name in your book or reserve a home in heaven. But you died on the cross and rose again to do all that for me. So I'm going to trust you to do that for me. But now you know how I'm going to live. Every day I'm going to say, Lord, the way I'm supposed to live today, I can't. I'm weak, but what you did for me on the cross and at the empty tomb, and what you're doing for me by the Holy Spirit makes it possible for me to live a holy life. And I'm gonna trust you, that's what faith is, to live your life through me, and I'm gonna tell you, it works. Now, I think it was before I started traveling and came to First Baptist Church, but my friend evangelist John Getch over there at West Coast Baptist College, got a hold of me and asked me to come and speak at an educators convention that they were having on the college campus for Christian teachers in, uh, in California. So I went out there, first thing I did was made a big mistake. I got up and they introduced me and it was very nice to me and I got up, he asked me to speak three times about revival to Christian school teachers. The big mistake I made was this, I got up and I said, well, I'm certainly glad to be here at West Coast, and I'm glad to be in California. I've never been to the left coast before. You know what I thought that would mean? Ha ha, funny joke, nobody laughed. <laughs> you better keep your mouth shut, buddy. That's always a good advice. <laughs> but you know what? I spoke for a little while about this, 
about how to live the Christian life, Christ in you. Not by works, not by gritting your te teeth, not by the flesh, because that's counterproductive. Your, self, your flesh is selfish and sinful. See, the way you live the Christian life is you say, I'm weak, but you're strong. Amen. So today I'm going to give you my life and trust you for the power to live this life. Live your life through me. They don't need an improved version of me. My wife doesn't need an improved version of me. My coworkers don't need a, an improved version of me. You know who they need? They need Jesus Christ, the very one who walked the roads of Galilee. And you actually live in me, and you can live in Saginaw, where they really need you. Through me, not I, but Christ. Well, I got finished. There was some interest in what I had to say. I got to talk two more times, but I'll never forget this. One of the students came up to me and said, now let me ask you a question, Brother Flanders. And he asked me a couple questions about living the life that way. Then he says, I got one more question. Does this work for you? I said, I'd like to testify, it works for me. He said, that's all I need. I'm gonna let it work for me. And I'm gonna tell you something, friends. It's the only way to live the Christian life. Let Christ live his life through you. Every other way you try fails, right? But there's somebody inside you who will make it happen. <laughs> so Paul says, I'm praying that they'll know the strength of the Spirit the life of Christ inside. Now listen to this, I'm moving on fast. Read this next part, starting in verse 17, the second half. Now look at this, this is actually paradoxical. It goes like this, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, our Christian life is rooted and grounded in love, the love of Christ that sent him to the cross, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints, what is the breadth and length and depth and height? This is a crescendo. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that she might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now read those verses again to yourself. End of verse 17, then 18 and 19. And let me ask you a question. How can you know what you can't know? I'm praying that you'll be able to comprehend the love of Christ, how wide it is, how deep it is, how high it is, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. How can you know what you can't know? Now, there's an answer to that that isn't just kind of like preacher talk. It really is, if we were just sitting down talking, there is a way to know what you can't know. Okay, there's a lot of things I don't know. I don't really understand electricity, but I know how to turn on the lights, usually. Okay, I don't understand what's going on under the hood of my car. Got a nice car, and I like driving it, but I don't understand it. But I couldn't explain it to you, I couldn't fix it. How do you know what you can't know? There is a way. Now, I got a computer when I first started traveling for the cause of revival. My son-in-law said, Dad, you need a laptop. I said, no, I'm not into technology. Well, I'm into technology. Everybody is now. So a laptop computer, and I learned about email, I learned about this, learned about all that. I don't know anything about how a computer would work. Faster than the speed of light looking up every kind of information and bringing it to me like that. I don't know how that works, but you know what? I know how to use my computer. When I first started using my computer, I would have computer savvy friends who would give me advice, and it was usually this. Just try it, and you'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, do what it says, find out what works, what doesn't work, how many of you would say, I know a computer well enough to know that? So even though I don't understand computers, I know my computer. At least I know it well enough to use it for what I use it for. Do you know how you can know what you can't know? By experience. 
that you might know the height, the depth, the width, the length of the love of Jesus Christ, which passeth knowledge, and that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I wonder what that is, Brother Howell. Filled with all the fullness of God. And the way I put it is this. He says, I pray, Father, they'll know the strength of the Spirit, the life of Christ inside them, and that they'll know the experience of God, that they'll be able to ex experience God. Now, Baptist people are not supposed to talk like that. <laughs> But in John chapter 14, Jesus Christ said, the Holy Spirit will come and live inside you. You'll get several benefits. One of them is this, you'll be able to see me. Go back and read John 14 tonight. In one part of John 14, it says you can see the Father. Later it says you'll be able to see the Holy Spirit. No kidding. Then Jesus said, the world seeth me no more, but you see me. He says, if you keep my commandments, I will manifest myself to you. Wow. Manifest myself. I will show myself to you. You know what that is? Spirits in God. That's part of the Christian life. I remember when I first went over to Junietta Baptist Church, we showed up there. They had had trouble in the church. We're talking about way back 1973. Only it was worse than they told me. Any of you young men called to the ministry, I'm going to tell you something. When a church looks at you as being a candidate for a pastorate, they never tell you everything. Now I was on the scene unpacking our bags at the parsonage, facing things a lot bigger than a 25-year-old guy would ever know what to do. And as we were working, I said to my wife, I said, Tony, I want you to excuse me for a little while. I went upstairs to the only room in the house with air conditioning. I got down on my knees next to the bed and I said this, Jesus, in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you for a few things. But right now, I just need to know you're with me. And I don't know how to say this, but in five minutes, I knew. <laughs> And Christians all over the room have had God manifest himself to them. And according to John 14, dedicated Christians who love him and seek to keep his commandments will have that happen occasionally to encourage you. How many of you have ever seen God in that sense, in a spiritual way, where he manifests himself to you? Raise your hand. I could take a long time to talk about that, but that's part of our salvation it's great and then number four he says i want you to make it so they understand the strength of the spirit the life of christ inside the experience of god how to experience god and you notice it's love wouldn't it be a great thing to be a member of the a church where you can walk in and feel the love not just the love of the deacons, not just the love of the members, not just the love of the pastor. We have all that. But where you could feel the love of Jesus Christ. Where even if you were lost, you could sit there and say, what is that? How many of you have ever been in a church service where you could feel God? I've been there. Could I tell you that's what ought to be? You know what that is? We're reading about real Christianity. We're reading about what happens in revival. God manifests himself. But number four, don't miss this, the end of the climax. Doing the impossible. 20, oh man, look at, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church. That's where God's at work in the world, this church. Be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Verse 20, according to the power that worketh in us. Yeah, the impossible. There was a day when Christian people, Bible-believing Christians, believed in the impossible. When I first got saved, I was led to Christ through a radio preacher who called himself a fundamentalist. Have you ever heard that word used in a positive way? And I'm not talking about Islamic fundamentalists. I'm not talking about bomb throwers. He was a Bible believer who stood up for the Word of God. 
and he preached the gospel the clearest I ever heard it, and I ended up getting saved, and I'm so glad that I did. Now, back when I got saved and came into the fundamental Christian world, you know what we would talk about? Worldwide evangelism. Everybody in the world, in my lifetime, every creature, we'd talk about it like it was going to happen. We would talk about revival. We could have another great awakening. We prayed for it. We believed in it. Then God put me out to pasture. Junietta Baptist Church. How do you like that for a name? Way out there. Junietta Baptist. And I was taken away from the real world. And pastoring there in the 80s, I started to be invited into some Bible colleges and preaching. I would preach on revival. I'd come home and I'd tell my wife, Tony, you know what? Something's happened. It's like the faith has drained out. Fundamental people don't believe in revival anymore. They'll make excuses and say, that's for a different age. Can't happen if there's apostasy. And nobody's talking about worldwide evangelism anymore. Let's just support a couple more missionaries so to soothe our conscience. Few more books. Whoever talks about is everybody in the world going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? We just talk about how much money we've given to missions. Good for us. Nobody's serious about it. But you know what? When real Christianity prevailed, they believed in doing the impossible, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And they prayed for it. 1727 a local church with lots of problems in Germany, Saxony, had a real revival. We know the date, just like these guys said Thursday. It was a Wednesday night, August the 13th, 1727, in a little German town called Herrnhut. And God came. Matter of fact, some of their descendants have written a book called When the Spirit Came. Quite an amazing story. We call it the Moravian Revival, and missionaries all know about them. We're talking about a local church, not a denomination, a local church with major problems, discord, fighting, splitting, prayed for God to deliver them, had a revival on a Wednesday night during the communion service. People say, People who were there wrote down and said, we didn't know if we were still on the earth or if we had gone to heaven. And they said people who wouldn't speak to each other when they walked in were now embracing. And I, I know the details, but I want to take our time. They prayed, and you know what? In a few weeks, they were the only Protestant church on earth praying for the world. Then they started sending their young men to be missionaries. Even though there were no Protestant missionaries before them, they didn't have anybody's example to follow. They just said, we must go. They came to America. They came to South America. They came to South Africa. Matter of fact, we list the countries where the Moravian missionaries went. We're talking about a local church that sent their own members to the uttermost part of the earth. Yeah. You know one reason? They believed in it. They believed it could be done. Jesus, you said, to the uttermost part of the earth. Send us to the uttermost part of the earth. They prayed for greater works. Greater works. I don't know of a church doing more for the cause of Christ in our whole state than First Baptist Church. But I want, as a member, to say First Baptist Church needs a revival. A revival of what? A revival of that. Able to do exceeding abundantly above, not if we work harder or try more or get more volunteers and raise more money. No! But if we let God have his way and spread his love around the world through us, call our young people to go to the uttermost part of the earth, make any sacrifice necessary to turn this town upside down, this city upside down. You know, we ought to be calling on God to do more in Sackville to be more, do more in Michigan, to do more than ever in the world, more than ever in the world. Let the next few years be the most powerful time in the history of the world for the progress of Christianity and for the salvation of lost souls. Amen. 
That's the real thing, friends. And you know, one way that it comes is we ask God to bring it, like Paul did. Oh, God, we're sick and tired of lukewarm, halfway, carnal Christianity pretending to be what we ought to be. We're calling on you now to revive us again and bring all that back and send us to do things that even our fathers never saw done. Oh, God, fill us with the Holy Spirit and use us to touch our city and our world for God. Don't you think that would be the thing to do? That's why we're getting together to talk ourselves into it. God wants to do it. And he wants us to discover Christianity. I'd like us to stand up right now. We've got more to do. Let's all stand up right now and bow our heads. I won't have a stand, but just a minute. But I'd like you to bow your head with me and join me in praying. Oh, Lord, you said if two of us would agree on earth, concerning anything that we would ask it should be done for us of our father which is in heaven you said lord jesus the night before you died that if ye abide in me and my words abide in you ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you O lord we've read your words we think this is what you want now bring revival to our lives lord bring the ministry of the spirit Bring the life of Christ, bring the experience of God, God in us, all the fullness of God. And let us, Lord, have the faith to do the impossible. Let there be a change in our personal lives, our families, in our church, and in your family all over the state. Lord, we'd like you to begin it tonight at Fair Bridgeport and also all over the state. Oh, Lord, we're not asking you for anything you can't do or anything more than you want to do. So have thine own way. And if you have that kind of prayer on your heart, I'd like to suggest that right now you walk to the front, find a place on the front row or at one of these steps to kneel down and say, dear God, that's what I want. I am joining the Apostle Paul in asking that we will all discover real Christianity and name the one that God spoke to you about especially. Would you do that? It wouldn't matter if everybody came. I'm not worried about that. But as God speaks to you, come and pray. She's going to play Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. Maybe you know the words that will encourage us, but it's not the music. We're not doing it to musical accompaniment. We're having an actual talk with God about the thing that's nearest to his heart. You know, the angels say, you know what, Father, they're barking up your tree. They're asking for what you want, not just for what they want. They're asking for what you want. And may God help us to confess our sins, to yield our life, and ask for what God wants to do.